Buenas tardes, el día de hoy nos acompaña una invitada muy especial. Ella es astronauta retirada de la NASA, es una química estadounidense, es médica de urgencias, ha estado involucrada en tres programas espaciales principales en donde tuvo la oportunidad de viajar por siete días en la misión STS-51A del transbordador espacial Discovery el 8 de noviembre de 1984. Ha trabajado como soporte de operaciones de la Estación Espacial Internacional y en el desarrollo de la nave espacial Orion. Orion. Fue la primera mujer en ir al espacio siendo mamá de una bebé de tan solo 14 meses. Fue seleccionada junto con cinco mujeres más para ser las primeras mujeres astronautas. Fue encargada de diseñar el parche de su misión, añadiendo cinco estrellas por, las, por los, las cinco astronautas a bordo y una más por su hija, quien estaba esperándola en tierra. Su nombre es Anna Lee Fisher. Welcome to Acme, Anna, and thank you for accepting our invitation. Glad to be here. Looking forward to it. Okay, Anna. <clears throat> Tell us about the place where you were born and what influenced you to pursue a health degree. Well, I was born in New York, but I was only there for about three weeks. My father was in the military, so we moved a great deal. Um, we wound up settling uh, when I was um, in eighth grade, when I was 13 years old. And eighth grade um, in San Pedro, California, which is in Los Angeles, was my 13th school. So we moved a great deal. Um, while I was growing up. Uh, while we were stationed at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, just the, the last um, place my dad was stationed before we moved to California, um, I was 12 years old and I was listening to Alan Shepard launch, um, the first American man to launch in space. And when I listened to him talking to Mission Control, for some reason that captured my, um, my, my imagination. And at that moment, I said, it doesn't seem very likely, but if I ever get a chance, that's what I want to do. And then, of course, um, uh, we, we wound up moving to California. And as I continued in my education, it didn't seem like it was going to be a very likely possibility because at that time, all the astronauts were men. They were test pilots. Women were not even allowed to serve in the military at that point and fly Um, high performance jets so that they could get the requirements to to qualify. So it didn't seem like a very likely um, possibility, but still the seed was planted. And I, I never forgot that that's what I really wanted to do. Thank you, Anne. And since the moment you applied for the astronaut program, how long that process lasts until you were chosen? And how was the reaction when you got notified? Well, that all happened rather quickly, my, um, I was in the process, I had kind of given up that I would ever have a chance to be an astronaut. I was in the middle of my medical training um, at a UCLA affiliated hospital, one of the county hospitals in Los Angeles, um, and was in the middle of my training. Uh, and um, I can still remember my, my, my then fiance and later husband, Uh, was um, also in medicine and was talking to one of my medical school friends who was the intern on his surgical service. And uh, Mark was very interested in space and he had heard that NASA was looking for astronauts, not just pilot astronauts, but mission specialist astronauts. I can still remember my husband paging me and saying, Anna, it's, we have one month till the deadline. And um, you know, back in those days, it wasn't easy. You didn't just go online to, um, uh, to apply. You had to write or call and get the application, you had to get your transcripts, your letters of recommendation. So this was about a month before the deadline that, I, that uh, we found out. And um, it took about that entire month to get the whole application together. And I got it in about a day before the deadline. And six weeks later, I was in Houston in the first group of women that were being interviewed for the U.S. space program. So that was, um, so the uh, applications were due in June of uh, 19, June 30th, 1977. Six weeks later or so in August, I was in Houston interviewing and in January of 1978, um, got the call and found out that I was one of the 
lucky members of this first new class of astronauts, um, specifically for the space shuttle. There were 35 of us, 15 pilots, 20 mission specialists. The most diverse class NASA had ever selected, if you look at our picture of what our class looked like, and the first class of women. Um, the reaction was uh, amazing. <laughs> you know, my friends were all excited for me, my family. Um, the, the news media right away were coming to do interviews. And it was kind of strange because when the, when the day before you weren't an astronaut, the, the next day you're an astronaut, nothing has changed in between. You don't know anything more than, than you knew the day before. So it was kind of funny trying to do all these interviews while you still really didn't know all that much about what you were getting into, but it was it was so exciting. I, I will never forget that day as long as I live. So one of your partners in that mission was um, Sally Wright, right? In my mission? Oh, no, I mean, Sally was in my class. She was one of the six uh -huh. women, right, but she was not on my flight. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Well, that is wonderful. Okay, Anna, let's talk about the moment, um, about the trip on the Discovery. Uh, those of us who haven't been lucky enough to go to space uh, don't understand the normal change that it implies being on microgravity, beyond the fact that every astronaut gets trained for it. How was the reaction of your body the first hours in space, and how did it react when you came back to Earth? Well, um, <laughs> that's a... Big question, a lot of parts to it. You know, there's when you first get into space, I would say 60 to 70 percent of astronauts and cosmonauts have what's called space adaptation syndrome. And that's a fancy terminology for a, a syndrome, the symptoms of which are just like being seasick nausea, malaise, don't want to eat. And I was really worried that I would be one of those. And so I was very careful the morning we launched. I didn't eat a big breakfast. I didn't drink a lot and everything. And sure enough, almost within 30 seconds of the um, main engine cutoff, I knew I was going to be one of the ones that had that syndrome. But I had also been a scuba diver earlier, and I used to get seasick when we were out on the boat going out to dive. So that was not a, a new experience for me. And I was so careful that I hadn't eaten anything, so I didn't throw up or anything. But you didn't feel great. You just felt kind of, you know, just kind of under the weather. So it, it made the first day or so not be as much fun as, as it could have been. But you still did your job and what you needed to do. But on the morning, so for the next day or so, I didn't really eat a lot because I definitely didn't want to throw up in space. And so um, I woke up on the morning of the third day and I felt amazing. And the rest of my flight, uh, you know, I ate normally, everything went fine, but it just, it did take about two days to, to adjust to microgravity and have your brain and your, all your sensory systems, um, you know, a, a, adapt. Um, and then um, coming back to Earth, uh, it, it's a similar adaptation process, but for, for the shuttle flights that were shorter, um, that adaptation is a lot faster. Um, as we, when we first landed, well, let me back, one of the things that happens when you go into space is the blood that normally pools in your legs no longer pools in your legs because there's no gravitation. So that ex that extra fluid, if, if you want to think of it that way, goes into your central venous system. And over the next few days, um, you get rid of it by, by your urine. So when you're coming back, you are relatively dehydrated relative to 1G um, conditions. We try to drink a lot of fluids just before the deorbit burns to, to counteract that. But I knew that if I drank all the fluids that they recommended, that again, I would, was more worried about throwing up during reentry from all those fluids. So I drank some, but not as much as you were supposed to. So when we landed, two things I remember, I felt very lightheaded because I was, you know, probably dehydrated and most, yeah, 
pretty definitely dehydrated. And then I also felt like an 800 pound gorilla. You just felt so heavy. And it was very hard to do simple things like lift your arm. I had some switches to throw on the overhead panel that in the simulator took me 30 seconds. It probably took me three minutes to, to do a simple task. But over the next 24 hours, those symptoms gradually went away as you drank some fluids and so forth. And I would say by about 24 hours later, you were back to normal. For, the, for crews that go on the space station and they're up there for six months, it's totally different. It's a much longer uh, process to rehab because they have a lot of other things that happen when you're in weightless a long period. But for shuttle flights, the longest of which was about two weeks, the recovery was pretty quick. Okay. Uh, I heard that uh, sometimes uh, astronauts, on when they are in prefer spicy food because they can taste it better uh, just of the lack of gravity are like a kind of congested because of the of the water and all the process you said right. and I heard that that they prefer like the spicy food because they can feel the, the flavor much better right uh, well again I think that goes back to whether it's a shorter shuttle flight or a longer um, six month flight, like for the uh, cruise on the International Space Station. Um, mm -hmm. I like spicy food. I live in Texas, so <laughs> I love <laughs> very spicy food anyway. Um, but the food on, and again, we were kind of early in the program uh, on our flight. We were still kind of learning those things. So um, my favorite food actually was beef stroganoff, but definitely the crews that are on um, Space Station for six months it's really important to to get good spices for the for the food because um it, it just after a while the food no matter and the people who make our food are wonderful they do they try so hard to make creative dishes and things that will um you know uh, something that you would really enjoy eating but after a while you know it, it does get to be kind of old and so definitely um crews tend to want pretty spicy food. But for me, I want that all the time anyway, so. I understand. Uh, Anna, and what duties did you have in the space, in the space shuttle as a mission specialist? What, my duties? Did you ask my duties on my flight? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, uh, I had several. One, I was the um, uh, flight engineer, so during ascent and entry. Um, I was supposed to you know, follow with the commander and the pilot and make sure we were doing the right procedures, if there was a malfunction, to make sure that we were working the right procedure and, and so forth, and to remind them of any actions that we had to take and so forth. So that was one of my jobs, and that, that involved a lot of my training time because I had to be on every asset entry sim that the commander and pilot um, were in. So hundreds of hours. And then secondly, I was the robotic arm operator for my flight. Um, our flight was such a difficult flight. It was the first time anyone ever brought hardware back from space that we really didn't have a lot of experiments, but I did have one um, very small experiment that we had on the mid deck that I was responsible for. And also we deployed two satellites so I was the, the lead for the deploy of one of the satellites and the backup for the deploy of the other one. So, so just a lot of different, a lot of different roles. And then also during the rendezvous with the satellites that we were gonna bring back, um, I was the one who helped the commander do all the burns um, that we were doing for the rendezvous because my other crewmates were below in the mid deck getting into their suits and getting ready to go outside and our pilot Dave Walker was helping them. So it was just my commander Rick Houck and I on the flight deck doing all the burns for the uh, rendezvous. So I had a lot of different jobs, but it was really fun. And on Earth, you had a lot of uh, work with NASA also. And uh, during your work, you also work at the Orion capsule. And during your work, uh, what were your contributions on this project? Well, actually, once I returned from my spaceflight, a lot of things happened that led up to what you're asking about. 
first of all, uh, shortly after I flew was the Challenger accident. So the program mm -hmm. kind of came to a halt for about two, two and a half years until they solved the problem with the solid rocket boosters. I was actually six weeks from my second flight when the Challenger accident happened. So um, there was a lot of things we worked on, but I finally decided um, that uh, that we wanted to have our, you know, I had my our first daughter, in fact, I was the first mom to fly in space. And so my, uh, we decided we wanted to have a second child. And long story short, I wound up uh, taking a seven year leave of absence. Uh, and I came back in 1996 and I was chief of the space station branch and was very involved at the very beginning of the space station and learning to work with our international partners, the, uh, and particularly with the Russians in the early part of the program. So I did that through um, Expedition 2, the first two crews that were launched to the space station. And then I was going to get in line to go fly myself again. And around that time, uh, shortly after that, the Columbia accident happened. So we were uh, again um, down uh, in uh, for a couple of years till we figured that out. So finally, um, I worked on space station for a while, and then finally um, they asked me to work on the Orion project, which is the current vehicle that NASA is working on, part of the Artemis program to go back to the moon, um, specifically working on the development of the displays um, and, and procedures and the procedure viewer, because we were going to go to an electronic procedure viewer. So um, so once I returned from space, there were, so I've had the the good fortune to work on three major programs, Space Shuttle, Space Station, and, and then the Orion program um, before I retired in April of 2017. That was a long answer to your question. <laughs> okay, so during, uh, all, with all the things that you have done in NASA, what memory sticks out to you most then? Oh, that's such a hard question to answer because there's so many. Obviously, going into space was the pinnacle of, of, of my career, of any astronaut's career, and particularly the fact that we were the first crew ever uh, to go into space and bring back two satellites that the rocket motor that was supposed to take them to a higher orbit failed. So there were these very valuable multi-million dollar communication satellites that were worthless because they were in the wrong orbit. So no one had ever done anything like that. And these satellites are huge. They're about the size of one of those small school buses and no one had ever done anything like that. So I will never, you know, th th that was just so amazing. But I also enjoyed all the other things I did, I guess, the other thing that really sticks out the most is working on the early, being chief of the space station branch within the astronaut office as we were getting ready to um, fly the first crews up to the International Space Station, working with our Russian mm -hmm. counterparts and um, all of our other um, international partners. But in the early days, it was mostly with the Russians and you know, learning how they think and trying to make everything work because they really, you know, they had been in space for as long as we had, and they actually had much more experience in long duration uh, flight. So that was just really interesting. And we made a lot of um, friends and partnerships during that time period. So that's another thing that, um, that really sticks out uh, for me, but there's just so many um, I'm just so grateful to have had this career and being able uh, to be a part of the first steps as we leave our planet. So, but those are probably the, the two most important. Do you think that we are prepared to go to Mars? And if you had the chance to go on a mission to Mars, will you go? Oh, no, we are not prepared to go to Mars at all at this moment. There's so much more we still have to learn. That's why we want to have the Artemis program. We want to go back to the moon when you're only three or four days away from home so we can learn all the things we need to learn uh, to go on to Mars, how to build a habitat, how to grow your own food, how to treat medical uh, problems that arise, and all that, those kinds of things. 
um, we, we, we can learn those things while we're relatively close to Earth on the moon um, so that if there's some major problem, we can come back easily. Because once we go to Mars, I mean, you're, you're talking at the moment, and that's one of the issues. We still don't have a propulsion system to go to Mars. That's one of the big technical challenges we have to solve. But de depending on what kind of propulsion system we have, it could take anywhere from three months to six months just to get to Mars. You have a communication delay of about five minutes. So like if um, the ground calls us to tell us about something, it takes five minutes to get to us and then another five minutes to get back. So you need to be much more independent than we are in the current environment. So we need to train crews to be more self-sufficient and less reliant on mission control uh, to solve problems. And then we have to figure out about the radiation in space. And we also need to determine how we're gonna provide electrical power. Just using solar arrays would make it very difficult. You know, I think we need to consider nuclear power. Um, and so that, of course, would be another big issue that needs to get resolved. And so there's just, we have a lot of issues that um, could we, uh, like Elon Musk wants to, you know, just go on to Mars. Well, you can do that, but that would be a very risky thing without laying the proper groundwork. You could probably do it but you're probably not gonna bring the crew safely back. Um, so, you know, that, that's a philosophical issue. Do you want to wait and work really hard and make sure that it's gonna be safe for a crew? Or do you wanna, just like in the days of um, exploration, uh, when they discovered the new world or when people from the East Coast of the United States went west. I mean, those were all very risky things people did. So, but no, so to answer your question, are we ready to go to Mars now? I don't think so, but will we be? Yes, we're laying the groundwork so that we will be ready. Totally true. Um, we have known uh, very funny stories in the, in the space that uh, happened to, to some astronauts. Um, came to my mind, uh, one of those that happened to Alan Shepard when he had to be in, in his, uh, his space suit because uh, it was like the first program of the Mercury and, and he had to, to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any kind of uh, fun memory uh, when you went to space? Oh, there's lots of, I don't know if funny, uh, there's just so many memories that, um, that I have that looking out at the earth for the first time is amazing seeing meteors go below you <laughs> never really thought about it makes sense you're going to see meteors entering the earth's atmosphere from above um uh one time my commander uh we had walkmans back then we didn't have iphones with music and so forth so um he had, we were allowed to carry some music on board with us and he goes anna come here and I listened with his ear, one of his earphones and he was playing when you see the Southern Cross for the first time. And just at that point, we were crossing the equator and I looked out the window and I saw, really saw the Southern Cross for the first time because I had never been uh, to the Southern uh, Hemisphere. And, um, you know, just a, another funny story and I have my commander's permission that I can tell this story. Um, we were in the middle of the, um, uh, burns for the for the rendezvous with the satellites and we have a real strict rule on the on the shuttle um, that there should always be two people looking at every action and particularly if it's a critical action that you say okay my hand is on this switch is that the right switch yes i agree and there's always two people for everything well we were just getting ready to do the ti burn which is the burn that starts the whole rendezvous process the final portion of it very critical burn that it be done correctly. And all of a sudden, Rick had to go to the bathroom. And I go, Rick, you can't go to the bathroom. Not now, we're just about to do the burn. He goes, I've got to go to the bathroom. And I said, Rick, you can't do that. You're going to have to wait till after we do the TI burn. He said, I have to go to the bathroom. He said, just look at it and check it twice. <laughs> so I did the TI burn <laughs> myself. So anyway, just little things like that. But, you know, when you work together with with people for as long as we train, 
you really get to know each other well and uh, rely on each other. And, mm -hmm. and so I was glad he had confidence that I could do it by myself. <laughs> Yeah, that's funny. That's that's very true. It's, uh, mainly uh, clue in everything is just a teamwork, especially on space. Uh, well, um, I'm going to talk about something that we are looking uh, through the news and is very concerning for the world. And the world is being witnessing the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Do you think this conflict can influence um, on the space alliance with Russia and United States? That's a very tough question and one I've been struggling with the last few days. Um, I was so proud of how far we had come in our relationship. I remember, as I was telling you, when I worked on the early days of the space station program, um, you know, it took a while for us to um, overcome our differences, our different philosophies, but we really came to the point where we truly trusted and respected um, each other. And um, even when there were problems that were occurring at the political level, um, it didn't seem to affect our, our the, the people in the space program and the space station. We continued to work together, our friendships were strong, and what happened at the political level really didn't have much of an impact on us. I'm very concerned about where we are now. In fact, um, my my daughter, Kristen, is the space and defense correspondent for CNN. And I've asked her several times in the last couple of days, you know, I haven't heard anyone talk about the space station. Today, for the first time, I heard Representative Crenshaw say that we should um, pull out of um, uh, having have the Russians pull out of participating in the space st uh, station. Well, it's a lot more complicated than that. We depend, the, the, the two parts of the space station are very interrelated. And so to suddenly have one or the other of us um, not participate, I, I'm not 100% sure, but I think that could be the end of the program for both. Um, I'm not sure right now, because this all just started, how it's affecting cruise training in Moscow. I mean, we have crews going to Russia all the time to train. We have crews in training for the next uh, launch coming up and for several others after that. Um, and we have Russian cosmonauts coming over to the U.S. to train. They do all their emergency training in the U.S. So I honestly do not know what impact all of this is going to have, but I'm definitely very concerned. The thing that I always loved about the space program and what I always say in my talks is I thought space was one way where we can be united. Well, I'm almost done anyway, so uh, so uh, to to sum it up, I'm very concerned with where we are now whether our crews can safely go over there to train, whether their crews can safely come to the United States and train, will they be allowed to? Um, we are true partners in space. And although we finally have our own vehicle where we can launch the SpaceX Dragon, our own crews up to the space station, thank goodness for that. We are still, our, our programs are, are intertwined and I am very concerned, and I'm not really sure what the outcome is going to be. Okay, thank you very much. And my last question: What oh, what advice would you give to young girls and boys up there who want to follow in your footsteps and hope to go to space one day? Well, I used to say there were two ways to pathways you could follow, but now I'll say there's three. The first is um, you can join the military and become a pilot. You could become a pilot by the civilian route, but it's probably not going to make you competitive. So if you truly want to be an astronaut, join, be, join the military, uh, become a pilot, go to test pilot school. And I think that's still going to be um, a pathway in the future. So that's one way. 
The second way is you can choose any really area of a STEM field, science, uh, technology, engineering, and math, um, and, be, and you know, just become the best that you can be and also um, perhaps do some other things that show that you're comfortable in other environments like mountain climbing, scuba diving, get become a private pilot, um, you know, those sorts of things. Um, so that's another pathway and, and then do very well. And uh, I would still say get an advanced degree, either an MD or a PhD, because the people you're compete it may not be a requirement, but the people you're competing with are going to have those degrees. So just, you know, go for the best, the highest degree you can in your chosen field. And always choose a field that you love, whether you become an astronaut or not because there's lots of things that can keep you from becoming an astronaut that's not in your control. You could have a medical issue and so forth. So make sure that you're picking something you love, whether you become an astronaut or not. And the third way I now say is you can become a business person or someone like Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos, make a ton of money, and then you can you know, go into space by paying, <laughs> paying for your flight. So. Those are three ways. The first two are if you want to be a career astronaut. The third one, um, if you just want to go into space. So there's, there, the, I really do think space is starting to open up for everyone to be able to participate. And I think that's really great. All right, uh, Anna, thank you so much for, le for letting us learn more about you and your important work at NASA. I really appreciate your time. And I hope to see you in person the next time. Thank you so much, Patricia. It was, I always enjoy the opportunity to talk about space because I think it's so important to our future and also for young children to, to want to study in STEM fields. So thank you for the opportunity. Thanks. Bye. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. You too. Bye-bye. <laughs>